Robert Aldridge, farm manager of St Mary Stoken Farm, is accused of harassment, contrary to Section 30 of the 1965 Rent Act. He's pleaded not guilty. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public, whose names appear on the electoral register. I've never seen a man more beside himself. He just pushed straight through my front door into my lounge and started shouting, pushing us about. Me and my wife, that is. This is a tied cottage, he shouts. And you have been sacked, so you can effing well get out. Actually, he said something stronger than effing, my lord. Well, I told him he couldn't just walk straight into people's private homes and start behaving like Adolf Hitler. But he said he had every right. And that he'd half a mind to chuck us right out there and then, break the door down if necessary, and set the dog on us because we were worse than animals ourselves. Then he started to kick the furniture around saying to get rid of these effing old sticks. Actually, he said... Uh, Something stronger, yes? Yes, Mr Lloyd. So what did you do, Mr Gibbs? When I got rid of him, I rang the police. Yes, and you made a complaint against Mr Aldrich, the defendant, harassment, contrary to Section 30 of the Rent Act of 1965. That's right. Uh, there was uh, this other business as well. Yes, we will be coming to that. Now, how did you get rid of the accused on this occasion? Well, I kept as calm as I could, reasoned with him. That seemed to deflate him more than if I'd shouted back. And in the end, he just sort of ran out of steam and walked back out through the front door. And your wife? Hmm? What part did she take in all this? Well, she was terribly upset. Terribly. It made her ill, and she lost the child. You know, she was took the next day. She miscarried. That's right. And this was as a result of the oh, defendant's behaviour. Oh, no. The witness is not competent to answer medical questions, Mr. Uh, Lloyd. Uh, Your Honour, surely this is a matter of common sense. I disagree. What you are asking is a question for an expert witness, not a layman. <laughs> then let me put it this way. Are you aware of any reason other than the oh, shock really, of this distressing Oh, really, Mr. Lloyd, incident? you are now leading the witness as well. Apart from anything else, it's quite immaterial whether the accused conduct provoked the miscarriage. Uh, this is not a claim for damages. It would, however, be material to show that the accused knew Mrs. Gibbs was pregnant when he went to the house. As Your Honour wishes. Uh, did the accused know your wife was pregnant, Mr. Gibbs? Well, he must have. I mean, it was obvious. I see. Now, how long have you been working for St. Mary's Stoke and Estates? Ten years. And what was your position on the farm? Senior stockman. Had you held that position for a long time? About five years. I started as general farmman, then herdsman, then senior stockman. Yes. What position does the defendant hold? Well, he's farm manager, isn't he? He was my boss. Yes, did he give you your first job on this particular farm? Oh, yes. And what sort of relationship did you have with him? Well, we got on fine for years. So did our wives. We used to go out a lot together, dancing and that. We were all very fond of dancing. At one time, we all went on holiday together. And uh, then these... Last three years, things fell off between us. Why was that? Well, it was because of this tied cottage business, wasn't it? Well, I don't know, Mr. Gibbs. You tell us. Well, I became local secretary of the FUGB. What is that? FUGB, that's the Farm Workers' Union of Great Britain, Your Honour. Ah, I see, yes. We have been fighting this tied cottage business for years, for decades. I mean, I know we've got this new law that's just come in, but it's so watery, it doesn't cure anything. Now, Mr. Gibbs, you must leave the question of law to me. The alleged offence happened before the recent rent agricultural bill became law, so it is quite irrelevant. Well, it's barbarous when you and your children can be chucked out into the fields just on the mere whim of the farmer, even if you're ill, and sometimes just because you are ill. Mr. Gibbs, that's enough. I think a straightforward definition of a tied cottage might be helpful to the jury at this stage. Uh, will you please tell the jury what, in simple terms, a tied cottage is? Oh, yes. Well, it's uh, a house or a bungalow owned by the farm. And if you work for them, then you've got to live in that as part of your job. So that means that if you lose your job, you can be chucked out into the fields. Uh, uh, Your Honour, in fairness, it should be stated that an eviction could only take place with a court order, which in this case my client has already obtained. Mr Parsons, that is a matter of a cross-examination. Now, Mr Gibbs, 
uh, did this disagreement between yourself and the defendant affect your standard of work for the farm? Of course not. And your employment continued? Until the 3rd of September, 1975. And he suddenly sacked me. He said I'd got unreliable, my work was bad, but it's all lies. There's nothing wrong with my work. I have got certificates and prizes. I have been awarded prizes for it. Now, anybody can tell you that. Now, was your house mentioned when he sacked you? Well, he told me to get out because he wanted it. And I told him that wild horses wouldn't drag me out, so he got a court order to chuck me out. What date was that? 5th of January last year. Most hateful day of my life. And how long did the court order allow you? Well, six months, but this was my home. I mean, this was the only home that my wife and I had ever known. And the work I'd done in it, built a greenhouse, built an extension, done the plumbing, and I hadn't done anything wrong. Now, how did the accused behave towards you during those six months? Well, he didn't do anything for a long time. And then he suddenly cut off the electricity, the water, the sewage. Your Honour, really, my learned friend must elicit his evidence properly, so we know what is evidence and what is merely hearsay or assumption. You really must keep your witness on the rails, Mr Lloyd. Uh, did you see the defendant do those things? No, but he turned them on again a short while later, so he must have done, mustn't he? You may tell us only what you saw yourself. Now, do let's get on with it. Apart from the services being cut off, did anything else happen during those six months? Well, yes. Two weeks later, there was what I was telling you about. When he pushed his way into my home, started threatening us, kicking the furniture about, swearing at us. That's harassment, isn't it? It's barbaric. That's harassment under the Rent Act, Section 30. Yes, thank you, Mr Gibbs. Would you wait there a moment, please? Uh, Mr Gibbs, you are chairman of the subcommittee of the Farm Workers Union of Great Britain, which is fighting a campaign to abolish the tied cottage system altogether. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Did you organise a mass lobby of MPs on the issue last June, and have you contributed at least five articles to the local newspaper about the subject? Yes, I have. And is that why you've written to every national and Sunday newspaper, virtually inviting them to this trial, enclosing a summary of the facts which I can only describe as splendidly dramatic. It's a terrible case of harassment. People should know about it. Oh, certainly, Mr Gibbs, if these are the facts. I'm just rather disappointed that you don't make any reference to uh, thunderstorms, uh, miserable hovels and the workhouse. I mean, the fact is that the tide cottage issue is a highly emotive one, isn't it? Hmm? I mean, people get very worked up about it. Yeah, well, so would you if you lived in one. Yes, well, did you uh, make a speech, the text of which I quote from your union newsletter, in which you say, the system makes us all complete serfs, and we must break it no matter how and no matter what the cost. I did, and I stand by every word of it. Yes, so it's quite clear that you have a very strong ulterior motive in bringing this case, isn't it? Is it? Well, you have an axe to grind, Mr Gibbs. Would you rather... Like the limelight, too, don't you? I want to see justice done. Oh, yes. So do we all, Mr Gibbs. That's why we're all here. Now, um, when exactly do you say you were sacked from your job? 3rd of September, 75. Yes, 17 months ago. And where are you living now? In my house. Yes, so the possession order was never executed. <laughs> He was afraid to execute it. Yes. Are you paying rent? No, but... So, for well over a year now, you've been living in this house absolutely free of charge. Yeah, but I'm unemployed. An unemployment benefit? Yes, but... And supplementary benefit? That is my entitlement. I've been contributing for years. It's an insurance, you know, not a charity. Hmm. And what sort of uh, car do you run, Mr Gibbs? Renault 12. What year? Last year. So it's not quite a case of grinding poverty then, is it? Yeah, but I'm one of the lucky ones. It's all very fine for you to make me look stupid, Mr. Smarty Pants, but farm workers are the most exploited captive labour force Mr. that this Gibbs. country Mr. has Gibbs. ever... Mr. Gibbs, I uh, really cannot allow you to address learned counsellors, uh, Smarty Pants. 
Uh, for your part, Mr. Parsons, you are straying somewhat uh, far from the issue of harassment. Uh, Your Honor, in my submission, this is a case where a certain amount of background material is essential for the jury. I would agree to a certain amount, but maybe keep it to a minimum, please. Your Honor. Now, Mr. Gibbs, you've told the court that your dismissal on September the 3rd, 1975, was an act of victimization. That's right. Did you then apply to the Industrial Tribunal for compensation for unfair dismissal? What? Well, come now, Mr. Gibbs, being such an active union man, you would well know the procedure for dealing with a case of unfair dismissal through victimization. I didn't bother with that. You didn't bother? To tell you the truth, I was sick of Aldridge. Sick to the back teeth with, with him and the whole damn business. I didn't want dismissal, but when it came, I thought, right, move on. <laughs> but that's just what you didn't do. Yeah, but I couldn't get a job. Well, now. Uh... My instructions as a result of inquiries with the Foodster Job Centre are that between November 1975 and August 1976 you were offered three positions as a senior stockman in local farms, two at markedly higher rates than you've been getting at St Mary Stoken, and you turned them all down. Yeah, but they weren't suitable. But you said just now you couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a suitable job. But you turned these down, and the reason is clear, isn't it? You wanted to stay put. You wanted to create a crisis in your tied cottage tenancy so you could invite the press to follow it stage by stage. And this would enormously strengthen your case for abolition. And that's why you've cooked up this entirely baseless charge of harassment, isn't it? I have never heard so many damn lies in all my life. So why turn down two better paid jobs and stay put unemployed? I should like to turn now to the events of June the 17th, 1976, when you claimed that the defendant entered your house by force and shouted at you and threatened you and kicked the furniture about and so on. Yes. Who else was present? My wife, Bob Aldridge, and the man who took over my job. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Clayton. That's him, yes. Yes, well, we'll be hearing from Mr. Clayton later. So, there was just the four of you present. That's right. Uh, would it surprise you to learn, Mr. Gibbs, that both the defendant and Mr. Clayton have an entirely different version of what happened that morning? Well, they would have, wouldn't they? I mean, they say it was you who went berserk, uh, who started shouting at them and threatened them and physically pushed them out with a stream of obscene abuse while they remained calm. Absolute lies. I'm quite sure about well, that. Of course I'm sure of it. You uh, kept... Uh, you kept calm and reason with him. That's right. Really, Mr. Gibbs, with the way you feel about tied cottages. Beg your pardon? Well, I mean, we've all seen the effect that the tied cottage issue has upon you here in this court, and you're asking us to believe that confronted by the man who had unjustly sacked you, who had victimized you, who had obtained an eviction order to put you and your pregnant wife out into the gutter, who had entered your very home to abuse and insult you, that faced with him, you kept calm and reasoned with him? What was it to reason about, for goodness sake? I told him to sit down and to talk about it sensibly. I see. Now, tell me, Mr. Gibbs, are you a violent man? Of course not. Thank you. Hey? What's he mean? Does Your Honour have any questions for this witness? No, thank you. You may go and sit down. I call Mrs. Margaret Gibbs. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Give Mrs. Gibbs a chair, would you? No, that's all right. Are you sure? Yes, that's quite all right, Your Honour. <coughs> you are Mrs. Margaret May Gibbs, the wife of Ralph Gibbs, formerly senior stockman for St. Mary Stoke and Estates Limited. Yes. What is your address, Mrs. Gibbs? Valley Dean, Stoughton Farm, St. Mary Stoughton. Yes, that is the service house which you and your husband originally occupied as part of the terms of his employment. It's a tied cottage, that's right. Would you please speak up a little, Mrs. Gibbs? Oh, <coughs> I'm sorry, Your Honour. Mrs. Gibbs, the court has heard 
how your husband's employment was terminated and how the county court made a possession order on January the 5th of last year, giving you six months' notice. Oh, be thrown out, that's right. Yes. Now, was there any communication between yourself and the defendant for the first five of those six months? Well, I used to see him from time to time. I mean, bump into him, like, coming and going. Our house was just down the lane from the dairy complex, you see. And he used to ask me when we were going to go, that sort of thing. What would you reply? Well, that we had nowhere to go. And was he going to throw us out into the gutter? Now, did he ever threaten you in any way at that stage? No. No? Oh, he used to say that the herd would suffer because there was no stockman on site. I mean, if a beast was ill in the middle of the night, then she'd be just left to suffer because of us. And that worried you? Well, of course it did. My husband's a good stockman, and good stockmen care about their beasts, and I care about my husband. And did any suffer, to your knowledge? No. Oh, one died. That was 127. And he tried to make out that it was due to us and there being no one there, but I don't think it had anything to do with that. Did you say 127? That was her number, Your Honour. I always thought cows had names. It's only in children's storybooks where they're called Daisy. Oh. Sir, yes, uh, did the cow's death concern you? Well, yes, of course it did. But we had nowhere to go. I mean, the herd's important. But when it comes down to it, people are more important. Now, I want to ask you about the events of June the 1st, last year. Oh, yes. Do you remember what happened? Was that when the sewage and that? Would you tell us about that, please? Well, I was working in the kitchen, and I had the washing machine on, and then suddenly it stopped. The water and the electricity. So I went all around the house, and I tried all the taps and switches, and they was all off. And then the next time I flushed the jacks, it all came up all over the garden. I mean, it was, it was disgusting, it was unhygienic. Flushed the what? The toilet. Ah, yes. What time was that? It'd be the middle of the afternoon, about three o'clock. And could you see what had caused these stoppages? Well, no. But since all three things went off at once, then it stands to uh, reason uh, Mrs. Gibbs, I'm afraid you mustn't tell us what you think the cause was, but only what you actually observed for yourself. Now, did you take any action as a result? Well, yes, I did. I went and found Bob Aldrich and I asked him what the hell he thought he was playing at. And he said that I'd got no call to go crying my rights after the way we'd behaved and that I was trespassing and to get off at the double or he'd shoot my effing feet off. Actually, he used a stronger word than effing, my lord. So I went home and I phoned the newspaper man and he came round and saw for himself and then he wrote about it two days later. May she be shown exhibit two, please. Is that the article? Yes, that's it. And that appeared two days later. That would be on June the 3rd. That's right. Do you know whether the accused took the paper at that time? Yes, regular. So he would have seen this? Yes. Now, did anything else happen on the day that that article appeared? Yes. The water and the electricity and the sewage was all suddenly restored about nine o'clock. That would be a few minutes after the paper would be delivered at the farm manager's house. Yes, could you see how these services had been restored? No, but a few minutes afterwards I saw Bob Aldrich skulking around the dairy complex, not 50 yards off. Skulking, Your Honour? Furtive looking. In what way? Well, he was half leaning forward, half crouching. Looking like he didn't want to be seen, I thought. And he could have turned everything on and off from where he was. I mean, the stop stopcocks were all where he was. Mm. Now. I'd like to ask you about the events of June the 17th last year, when the defendant visited your home. Oh, when he kicked the furniture and that. Would you tell us about that? Well, I was working upstairs, and I heard this banging and shouting about. So I went down, and there was Bob Aldrich in the middle of our lounge. He was almost purple in the face and shouting at our Ralph that number 127 had died, and that he'd been up all night trying to save her. When the effing hell were we going to get out and let the regular stockman move in? Well, Ralph tried to talk sense to him, but he wouldn't listen to reason. And then he started kicking the furniture, our wedding suite and that. And he, and he started pushing Ralph around the room and shouting that he was going to put the dogs on us because we were worse than animals ourselves. And, and then suddenly he left. What effect did this have on you? 
I was sick. Well, I mean, this was our home. And, and he was like the Gestapo. I mean, he, he was just standing there, smashing the place up. I was 18 weeks pregnant at the time. And that night I had to be taken into the hospital. I lost the baby the next day. Thank you, Mrs. Gibbs. Uh, I'm sure there can be no one in this court, Mrs. Gibbs, who does not sympathize deeply with you over what you've just described. Thank you. So if I appear to question some of the things you've just been saying, please understand it is out of my duty to do so, not out of any wish to make you suffer further. Now, was that the first miscarriage you've ever suffered? Your Honour, what on earth has this to do with the case? I hope you have a good reason indeed for asking that question, Mr. Parsons. I have, Your Honour. Then I think we should allow this to go a little further. I'm obliged, Your Honour. Mrs. Gibbs, do you have children? No. Is it true that you suffer from anemia? Yes. And has this not been the cause of you suffering a number of miscarriages over the ten years of your marriage? Did you not ask advice about this once from the defendant's wife? But that was in confidence. That was confidential. We were friends in those days. Well, I'm afraid we have to know these things, Mrs. Gibbs, confidential or not. It is a fact, isn't it, that not all of these miscarriages were brought about by shocking experiences such as the one you've just described. Do we have to go into all this? Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Gibbs, but we have to get these things in perspective. You have suffered in this way before, apparently for no reason at all. So, the fact that you uh, suffered a miscarriage on the 18th of June does not indicate that anything untoward had happened beforehand. Now, Mrs. Gibbs, I'm sure you love your husband dearly and you very much want to give him children, but in the meantime, you help him as much as you can with his union work, don't you? Yes. Yes. Do you uh, share his desire to abolish the tied cottage system altogether? Oh, not to the point of lying in court. You would never lie on oath for your husband in court, even to help him. Why, be a fool to. No, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Gibbs, did your husband appear in this very court in May 1971? Uh, your Honour, I utterly failed to see that the previous convictions of this lady's husband, if there were any, have anything whatever to do with her evidence. If my learned friend will be patient for one moment, he will see the connection. Was he charged with common assault during a picket line dispute? Well, that's got nothing to do with this case. Did he conduct his own defence? He didn't trust lawyers. Was his evidence essentially an alibi that he was with you at home at the time in question? Yes, he was with me! You were his only witness and you did indeed swear on oath that he was with you. But the prosecution proved beyond all doubt that you were both lying and your husband uh, was convicted and fined. Isn't that so? So you were fully prepared to lie on oath in order to help him. The cases in Fulchester are fictitious. You can join us again tomorrow when the Queen against Aldrich will be resumed in the Crown Court. Ralph Gibbs was senior stockman on St Mary Stoken Farm near Fulchester. A year ago he was sacked by the farm manager, but he refused to leave his tied cottage. He claims that he was victimised and that Mr Aldrich illegally harassed him to get him to move. His wife supports this story. The Defence Council has alleged that in 1971 Mrs Gibbs lied on oath in court in support of her husband. I know the court found my husband guilty, and that meant they didn't believe my story, but I swear to God they were wrong, and I didn't lie on oath then any more than I am doing now. You're quite certain about that? Absolutely certain. 
Well, we shall see. Now, uh, would you look at this, please? Uh, could you pass this to the witness? Uh, members of the jury, you'll be getting copies of all these documents before you retire. Now, that is a Minister of Agriculture veterinary certificate giving the cause of death of the Frisian cow you called 127. Yes. What cause does it give? It says transit tetany, what we call transit staggers. Do you accept that is correct? Yes. Would that cause the beast undue suffering before it died? We might do. Suffering that might have been averted if a stockman had been on site. Well, he couldn't treat it. Yeah, but he could have called the vet. He would have realised at an earlier stage what was happening and called for assistance. I suppose so. You see, uh, Mrs Gibbs, I put it to you that the whole object of your Thai cottage being where it is, right next to the dairy complex, is precisely so that the stockman can do his job properly day and night, and in emergencies. Now, where was your husband's successor living at this time? Well, I don't see what that's got to... Oh, no. Answer the question, please. Park Cottage. And how far away is that? About two miles. So, it's hardly surprising that the farm manager would lose his temper over the loss of this animal in such circumstances. Yes, but he shouldn't harass us. I'm talking about loss of temper. He's got a duty to house us. He can't just turn us out. Yes, well, uh, didn't he offer you alternative accommodation? What? After the court order, did not Mr. Aldridge offer you Park Cottage for your own use? But that's a filthy hovel. I mean, it's, it's not fit for pigs, and it's stuck right up in the hills. Well, Mr. Clayton's living there now. He must have done it up then after he showed it to us. Oh, really, Mrs. Gibbs? What a very interesting theory. Now, tell me, how is this sewage disposed of in your present house? through the drains. Is there a main drainage? No, it's a cesspit. Yes, with an electric pump? I suppose so. So, any breakdown in the electrical supply would automatically mean that the sewage pump would temporarily cease to function? Perhaps. Or would it or wouldn't it? Well, I suppose it might. I mean, I can't say any more than that, can I? I'm not an electrician. You see, uh, Mr. Aldridge will not deny that he cut off the electricity to the entire dairy complex at about 3 p.m. on June the 1st, uh, when he was showing the new owner of the yes, estate Mr. Botany, the buildings. I saw him. Yes, but he turned it on again at 3.30. No. Or between 3.30 and 3.45. No. He didn't turn it on again. I mean, we were without it for two days, and the sewage came up into the garden. And what about the water? He turned the water off, too. Yes, and you say that you went to Mr. Aldridge in the farmyard to complain about it. Yes, I did, and he didn't do anything about it. It's because you didn't say what it was you were complaining about. What? Mr. Aldridge will tell us how you came up to him in the yard in front of Mr. Bottomley and started shouting and swearing at him and threatening him with a court action, but not once did you say what it was you wanted done. But he knew that. Not surprisingly, he ordered you off the place in some heat, and the first thing he knew what it was you had been shouting about was when he read about it in the newspaper some two days later. What? When he took immediate steps to make sure that all the services to your house were working properly. That Absolute nonsense! He found that the electricity and the sewage were working normally. But what about the water? An airlock. One quick thump and it was working perfectly. Is that what he told you? Well, he will swear to it in that box and be cross-examined on it. And his word on oath has not been found wanting. Look, do you think that my husband would be such a fool as to bring a case of harassment against him, with all his union watching if it could be dismissed as easily as that? Well, uh, that is my case, Mrs. Gibbs. But um, we shall have to see, shan't we? Lloyd, no further questions, Your Honour. You may leave the witness box, Mrs. Gibbs. I call Spike Fox. You are Spike Fox of 23 Mabledon Avenue, Fulchester, and you are a freelance newspaper reporter. That's right. May he be shown Exhibit 2, please. Thank you. Did you write that article in the Fulchester Gazette? Yes, I did. Did you write it as a result of an interview with Mrs Gibbs? Yes. Did you actually visit the Gibbs's house? Yes. When was this? That would be the uh, Monday before this appeared. That would be June the 1st, 1976. What happened when you got there? I saw that the water and electricity weren't working, and the uh, vegetable garden was a pond of sewage. Disgusting. A terrible health hazard.
Did you try to find out why these services were not working? Yes, I went right round the place, um, testing all the switches and taps, stopcocks and main fuses. They were all quite definitely in order, right up to the boundary of the garden, by the dairy complex. Did you draw any conclusions from this? That the services must have been cut off from another set of mains and stopcocks inside the dairy buildings. There was no other way it could have happened. Now, did you subsequently pay another visit to the Gibbs's house? Yes, I went out to the house again on June the 17th, after Ralph Gibbs had phoned me. I found both the Gibbs in a terrible state. They described how... Uh, Mr. I'm sorry, Aldridge... Mr. Fox, I'm sorry, you can't tell us that. Uh, but did you see for yourself any evidence to support what they told you had happened? Yes, the way the lounge had been wrecked. Furniture knocked over, glass broken and so on. And the state Mrs. Gibbs was in. She was terribly shocked, cold and shivering. Uh, and she was sick while I was there. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, would you stay there for a moment, please? How much are you being paid for this, Mr. Fox? What? You're a freelance reporter, are you not? You're paid by the article? Yes. Now, you sold this to the local paper and three national papers. Did any other papers buy it? Some others took it up. So how much have you made on the article altogether? I can't remember. Several hundred pounds? It might have been. Is it true to say that the juicier the story, the better it will sell? If you mean that I've concocted... No, no, no. no I mean what I'm asking. Is it true to say that the juicier the story, the more you get for it? Not to the quality press. Oh, come now, you're not trying to tell me that the four papers you sold it to represent the quality press. I report what is factually correct. The payment I receive does not influence what I write. You're a writer of integrity, you say? I try to be. And these articles were fair and uh, objective and... Look, they report what happened. Very well, Mr. Fox. Uh, uh, Mr. Spike Fox, is it? That's right. It's an unusual name. Uh, were you christened Spike? No. Uh, what were you christened? Oswald. Ah. Just have um, quite the same campaigning ring about it, does it? Tell me, how many articles have you written about the evictions from Tide Cottages? I have never counted. Ah, well, I have, Mr. Fox. Is this list of 18 articles written by you in various journals over the past three years, all on this topic, correct? Would it be true to say that you have strong feelings about these evictions? If you've ever seen a family, including young children, forcibly thrown out onto the street, uh, but that let me finish. What I thrown out by professional strongmen and, and all their furniture and possessions dumped on the pavement next to them and everyone screaming and crying and the husbands having to be forcibly restrained by the police and this now 1977 then you would have strong feelings about it too well uh, no one's doubting your good heartedness mr fox what i am questioning is your objectivity where did your information for those 18 articles come from every reporter has his sources Yes. Is it true that the Farm Workers Union of Great Britain are actively campaigning to abolish the tide si cottage system altogether? That's common knowledge. Yes. And have they appointed a subcommittee to seek publicity on this issue? I don't see what that's got yeah, to do answer with... Answer the question, please. Yes. And who's its chairman? That's got nothing to do well, with Who's its chairman, Mr. Fox? Ralph Gibbs. Yes. And has he supplied you with a, a great deal of material on this subject over the past three years? Well, the basis, in fact, for most of those articles and case histories. But why shouldn't he? Well, no reason, Mr. Fox. So long as the articles you read, then write are fair and unbiased. Of course they are. Yes. Now, why in the case of Gibbs didn't you interview the farm manager, the defendant, and get his side of the story too? I couldn't find him. Couldn't find him? I was only there a few hours. Uh, his phone didn't answer when I rang him. Where from? What? I mean, where did you telephone him from? Was it a public call box on the estate? The Gibbs let me use their telephone. Oh, I see. It, it wasn't that you weren't interested in his side of the story? No. No. Just uh, two other things. On your first visit, did you yourself see the electricity and sewage being cut off? No, but I... So, all you know about why they were cut off is from what the Gibbs told you? I suppose so. Yes. Now, on your second visit, did you see who wrecked the Gibbs' lounge and, and what caused Mrs. Gibbs' distress? But it was obvious. They told you? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Fox.
That is the case for the prosecution, Your Honour. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Parsons. I call the defendant Robert Aldrich. Take the book in your right hand and read aloud what's on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Robert Aldrich? Yes. And you're the farm manager for St. Mary Stoke and Estates Limited, and you live in the manager's house on the estate? Yes. Is that a Thai cottage? Yes. Uh, how big is the farm, Mr. Aldrich? Just over 2,000 acres. Yes, and who owns it? Last spring it was bought by a company called Emura Limited, owned by Mr. G.W. Bottomley. Before that, the owners were Stoke and Discretionary Trust. The main trustee was Lord Lovington, in whose family it has been for 300 years or so. Yes. What sort of farm is it? It's mixed. We have a prize herd of Frisians, some pigs and sheep. We grow cereals and peas, and we belong to a maize cooperative. Yes. Uh, now, Mr. Aldrich, would you tell the court just a little about yourself? Well, I took a BSc in agriculture at Reading, and then ran my family farm for a while. Lord Lovington offered me the managership of the estate some 12 years ago, and I took it. Yes. Um, are you on a monthly salary? That's right. Yes. Now, Mr. Aldrich, have you at any time attempted to harass Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs, interfered with their peace and comfort, or cut off their supplies and services to their house in an attempt to make them leave it? No, definitely not. Thank you. Now, the whole issue of tied cottages is an extremely thorny one, isn't it? No, I've never had any trouble over them, except from Ralph Gibbs. But uh, you would agree that uh, it causes a great many problems. Problems are caused by it. Far more would be caused without it. Yes, could you explain that? Well, take our herd, for example. Those beasts represent a capital investment of £80,000. The stockman must live by them, or he can't look after them. That means a service house, one built by the farm, on the site, for that purpose. I mean, he doesn't have to take the job. But if he does, it's part of the conditions he accepts that he lives over the shop, the only house from which it's possible to do the job properly. Yes, now we've heard that your senior stockman for several years, up until September 1975, was Ralph Gibbs. That's right. Now, how did he lose that position? I sacked him. Why? He became irresponsible. He started taking more and more time off without telling me to do his union work and neglecting his farm duties. I found he was skipping milking more times than I could remember. And he wasn't to be found at all during the last two AI visits. AI? Artificial insemination, Your Honor. I warned him several times, but uh, finally I had to sack him. Yes, was it a verbal dismissal? Yes, but I followed it up with a letter. Uh, in that letter, did you make any reference to his service occupancy? Yes, I said that we would endeavour to cope without the use of his house until he found himself a new job. But I warned him that we might have to ask for the house, depending on how uh, his successor was placed. Yes, did he reply to that? No. Did he at any time argue that he had a legal right to stay put? No, well, he hadn't, had he? Hmm. Did you offer him alternative accommodation? Yes, the estate offered him Park Cottage. That's a nice little cottage on the edge of a wood. It used to be a gamekeeper's cottage. It's not modern, and it is a bit quiet up there, but there's nothing wrong with it. Yes, rent and rates free? We asked a nominal rent of 50p a week, and the rates would have been paid by the estate. Yes, a very generous gesture. And did the Gibbs accept this cottage? No. So, what happened then? Well, after a while, it became clear that the beast's welfare was starting to suffer because of an absentee chief stockman. And it was costing the estate money. Ralph didn't seem to be making any effort to find himself a new job. So, very reluctantly, I applied for a court order for the house, giving him six months to move out. Yes, and what effect did this have? None, so far as I could see. The Gibbs stayed put. That's right. Yes. Now, I want to ask you about the first alleged harassment on June 1st. Yes. What were you doing at 3 p.m. that day? I was showing the new owner of the estate, Mr. Bottomley, around the dairy complex. Some of it badly needed rewiring. So I switched off the mains at about 3 o'clock in order to actually handle the cables myself and show him what a poor state they were in. 
Yes. Did you realize that this would cut off the power to the Gibbs house as well? Yeah. Quite frankly, I forgot. Yes. Anyway, it was all switched on again by half past three. And then what happened? After about five minutes, Meg Gibbs came screaming into the yard, screeching at Mr. Bottomley and me at the top of her voice, saying I was persecuting them, hounding them, and so on. I thought she was talk about, talking about having only a month to go before the court order expired. It never occurred to me that she was talking about the electricity. So she didn't mention electricity or sewage or water? No. Yes. So what did you do? I told her to get out. And fast. And it was a couple of days later that I was reading my local paper and I read about the terrible victimization at St. Mary's Stoken Farm. I immediately went down there. I found there was nothing wrong with the electricity, but there was an airlock in the water system to the house. Yes, and how did you deal with that? I thumped it with a milk churn. And that cured it? Within seconds. How do you know? And I saw the Gibbs garden tap suddenly gush. They must have left it on while they were wondering what was the matter. I see. So, uh, what was the next contact you had with Mr. or Mrs. Gibbs? That would be about a uh, fortnight later on uh, June the 17th. Yes, and what happened then? Well, my new senior stockman, Ken Clayton, woke me at about 5.30 in the morning to go and see 127, whom he'd found dying. We worked on her for hours and called the vet. But it had gone too far and he had to pull her down. Yes. Did the vet diagnose the cause of death there and then? Yes, he did. And it need never have reached that stage if there'd been a stockman on the site. Yes. So what did you do? I went straight across to the Gibbs's house. The front door was open. So I went straight into the lounge and found Ralph Gibbs. I told him what had happened and why. And I asked him when he was going to comply with the court order to move out so that his successor could do the job properly. Did you kick the furniture? <laughs> no. Of course not. Did you threaten Mr. or Mrs. Gibson anywhere? Absolute nonsense. No mention of putting the dog on to them or kicking the front door down? <laughs> no. I was angry, I'll admit. But I did nothing to harass them in any way. Yes. How is it that the court order was never enforced? Well, I never intended to chuck them out. And in view of what happened to Mrs. Gibbs's baby, I... Yes. And the importance of that house to the uh, proper running and care of the herd? We're managing, somehow. But only just. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Aldrich. That's a very moving story, Mr. Aldrich. It's what happened. The kind-hearted employer bends over backwards to do all that he can for the wicked an ungrateful servant who is now kicking him in the teeth, etc., etc. It wasn't like that at all, was it? It was as exactly as I've told the court. Yes, but there's so much that you haven't told the court, isn't there, Mr. Aldrich? How are you paid, for instance? How I'm paid? Yes, you said by monthly salary. Well, that's right. Only monthly salary? Well, I have a small share of the net profits. Ah, you didn't mention paid. that. So you have a financial interest in the efficient running of the farm? Well, of course, but then yes, all well, farm you managers... you said have... how much it was costing the estate to keep the Gibbs in their house. You omitted to say how much it was affecting your own pocket. It never crossed my mind. It never crossed your mind. Now, do you agree that as a farm manager, you are habitually arrogant and inconsiderate towards your men? You've got some strange notions. Well, it is a fact, is it not, that you have sacked a large number of men over the years? I've sacked men, yes. How many? Oh. Well, do you think the Fulchester Office of the Department of Health and Social Security would have a reliable figure? I should think so, yes. Will you look at Exhibit 3, please? That is a letter from the Fulchester Office of the Department of Health and Social Security, and it lists the men by name whom you sacked in the three years up to January of 1976. It looks like it, yes. Yes, the total is at the bottom. Would you read it out? 31. How many men do you employ at any one time? About 30. Well, that's a quite extraordinary turnover, isn't it? In fact, according to statistics prepared by the Ministry of Agriculture, that rate of dismissal is very nearly three times 
the national average. I can't afford to be sentimental about duds. Duds, Mr Aldrich? Particularly when farming is struggling to survive. Duds? Who chose them? Me, I suppose. Now tell me, why did you obtain an eviction order from the court, <coughs> excuse me, if you had no intention whatever of having it carried out? I wanted the Gibbs to know I meant business. Well, that also seemed most extraordinary. Not to mention a frightful waste of time for a heavily overworked court. Tell me, Mr Aldrich, have you had any dealings with the courts before on this matter of eviction? What? It's a perfectly simple question. In 1961, were you not convicted... Uh, Your Honour, is a Crown going to ride roughshod over all the rules of evidence? How can you justify it, Mr Lloyd? Your Honour, the accused claimed that he had an untarnished record in this field, and it follows, therefore, that I have a right to refute that. I have no recollection of the defendant making any such claim. Uh, well, Your Honour, I have a note that he was asked by an alone friend. The whole issue of tied cottages is an extremely thorny one, isn't it? To which he replied, Well, I've never had any trouble over them except from Ralph Gibbs. Now, I submit that this was a deliberate lie, and I wish to adduce evidence to show that. But, Your Honour, the law relating to eviction before the Rent Act was uh, quite Your Honour, this is not a matter of substantive law. The accused claimed that he'd never had any trouble before with tied cottages, therefore... Look, I, I was 22 at the time and very inexperienced. Never under intolerable provocation. Yes, Mr Aldrich, nevertheless, you were convicted. Your Honour, there's no resemblance whatsoever Mr. between Aldridge, these two cases. Mr Aldrich, I order you not to interrupt. Yes, Mr Lloyd, you may continue. Were you convicted at Montgomery Assizes in May of 1961 of actually throwing someone out of their tied cottage yourself and with considerable violence? Well, yes. The cases in Fulchester are fictitious. You can join us again tomorrow when the Queen against Aldrich will be concluded in the Crown Court. Gibbs was formerly senior stockman on St Mary Stoken Farm near Fulchester. A year ago he was sacked by the farm manager Mr Aldrich, but he refused to leave his tied cottage. He claims that he was victimised and that Mr Aldrich illegally harassed him and his wife to force them to move. Counsel for the prosecution has just revealed that in 1961 Mr Aldrich was convicted of the illegal eviction of the tenant of another tied cottage. There is no resemblance whatsoever between the two cases. Nevertheless, you did evict someone yourself from a tied cottage and you used unlawful force to do so. Your Honour, I would like the chance to explain the Your difference Honor, between Your Honour, I don't see how the details of the case can amount to any more than an attempt to blur the issue, which is that the accused has not hesitated to use violent and unlawful tactics towards the occupiers of tied cottages in the past. Oh, I think that's a bit hard, Mr Lloyd. The defendant mustn't leave the jury with a distorted picture. As Your Honour pleases. Mr Aldrich? This happened on my father's farm. A family farm of 150 acres in North Wales. Four of us ran it. My father and me, a man called Willie Thomas, and a fourth man. The time came when we had to sack Willie. Because he just stopped working. He took to lying in bed all day. Drinking himself silly. Absolutely useless. That meant that the remaining three of us had to share his work. A hundred hours a week. A killing pace. 
on a farm that was up to its ears in debt anyway. We couldn't get a replacement for Willie because we couldn't get his cottage back. He just stayed put, no matter what we did. And we tried everything. Then one day, my father had a heart attack. Due directly to the gross overwork of having to do Willie's work too. Three days later, he died. On the afternoon of the funeral, I went up to Willie's cottage and I threw him out into the mud and all his possessions too. He was drunk and he stank. That's what I was convicted for. Anyone would have done the same. No, Mr. Aldrich, they would not. Some would have observed the law. You were convicted of assault in connection with an unlawful eviction. Yes. Were you fined 100 pounds and bound over to keep the peace? Yes. So you lost your temper and you used violence to throw a man out of his lawful dwelling. Now, whatever the provocation, no civilized society can tolerate that. What happened to the family farm? We sold up. Sold up, Mr. Aldrich. You went bankrupt, didn't you? Yes. Yes. And did not the official receiver's report say, inter alia, one factor which contributed to the insolvency was the inability of Mr. Robert Aldrich to retain his staff, which appears to have been due to his somewhat cavalier attitude towards their welfare? That old fool never did an honest day's work on a real farm in his life. Insecurity of employment seems to have dogged you throughout your career, does it not? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, with St Mary Stoke and Farm changing hands, was not your job as farm manager uh, not somewhat in jeopardy? Of course not. But a change of ownership of a farm often brings with it a change of farm manager, does it not? Sometimes, yes. Yes, and you told the court how much the continuing situation with the Gibbs was costing the estate, and that was a situation that you had allowed to come about. Well, I couldn't help that, could no, I? but it had happened during your farm manager. Yes, but it was nothing directly well, to do with... it could with... hardly have been expected then to impress your new employer. So surely it would have been very much in your interest to get rid of the Gibbs as fast as possible. On the contrary. They would have created even more stink in the press. Gibbs had been a thorn in your side for years, hadn't he? Yes. You've called him unreliable and a troublemaker. That's right. In what way was he a troublemaker? He became belligerent about all sorts of issues. Tied cottages was only one of them. He became like an obsessive shop steward, holding lunchtime meetings of the farm staff, lecturing them on their rights, trying to organise a strike against August Bank Holiday working, that kind of thing. Yes, these meetings, they were in the men's own time. Well, of course they were. To inform them of their rights under the law. Troublemaking. Bolshiness. But it was you who was being unreasonable. Most people do stop work on August Bank holiday, after all. Most businesses can just stop the machines. But you can't stop animals needing to be fed, herds needing to be milked, the distribution of food to yes, pigs... Yes, so, so you quarrelled with him over these issues? Yes. You grew to dislike him? He drove me wild. He drove you wild. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, are you a man with a hasty temper? I don't think so. I think I'm a pretty tolerant one. Oh, really? Maybe show any exhibits two and four, please. Thank you. Do you recognize those newspaper articles by Mr. Spike Fox? Yes. What do you think of them? Trash and lies. The picture they give, then, is a false one. A load of rubbish. Did you see the articles when they first appeared? Yes. What did you do about them? What the hell could I do about them? Well, you astonish me. Several extremely damaging articles appear in the press, giving details of your actions against the Gibbs. They don't mention me by name. Not by name, no, but they do mention uh, St Mary Stoke and Farms, they mention Mr and Mrs Gibbs in their house, the dairy complex, and they describe what happened to the Gibbs very fully. Now, even a child could infer that you were responsible. Yet you say you did nothing. Not even write a letter to the editor. Good God. I've got better things to do with my time. And what notice would editors take of a letter from me? Well, I should say a great deal. The press council are very hot on irresponsible editors. But presumably you did take legal advice about these articles. I didn't have the time. Of course, you didn't take advice, and the reason is clear to everyone in the court. 
wasn't because you didn't have the time, but because the articles were true. Nonsense. And you knew that you hadn't the faintest hope of refuting them. In the incident of June the 1st, for instance, are you seriously asking the court to believe that you forgot that cutting off the electricity supply to the dairy also cut it off to the Gibbs's home? Yes. Well, when did you realise what had happened? Well, a couple of days later, when I read it in the papers. Yes, whereupon you immediately rushed down to the Gibbs's house to make sure that they weren't being inconvenienced in any way? I wouldn't put it like that. No, I'm sure you wouldn't. Uh, would you agree that the implication that you had cut off the electricity was extremely damaging to you? Well, it could be, yes. Yes, then why on earth didn't you take a witness with you when you went down to their house? A witness who could have confirmed that the, su that the supply was still connected. It never crossed my mind. It never crossed your mind. It's an awful lot that didn't cross your mind, Mr Aldrich. The inevitable consequences of your using threats and violence when you visited the Gibbs's home on June the 17th, for instance? I did not use violence. They both said you did. Well, they're lying. You're not a violent man? I'm a pretty tolerant one. Who does not use violence? No. Anyway, I'd be a fool under these circumstances. Just one last thing. Is your wife in court? What's my wife got to do with this? Just answer the question. Is your wife in court? No. Are you still married, Mr. Aldrich? Uh, Your Honour, what possible relevance can the defendant's marriage have in a case of harassment? Yes, I must admit the connection eludes me, too. Uh, Your Honour, the grounds for the defendant's divorce are extremely relevant to this charge. I shall be obliged if Your Honour will allow me to continue this a little longer. I suppose we'd better. But, Your Honour, it's. Uh, no, Mr. Me. Parsons, I think we should hear this. If it's relevant. I'm obliged. Well, Mr. Aldrich, who divorced whom? My wife divorced me. On what grounds? Irretrievable breakdown of marriage. Yes, of course, but due to what? Well, did you contest the action? Of course I did. And was not Mrs. Gibbs the chief witness for your wife's action? And did she not give evidence of your persistent and unreasonable violence whenever you lost your temper? No connection with this case whatsoever. Blows, Mr. Aldrich. Shouting and threats and kicking the furniture. Did she not assert in evidence that whenever you lost your temper, you used violence? Just as you did when you threw Willie Thomas out of his cottage into the mud against the law. Behaviour that no civilised society can tolerate and for which you were rightly and properly convicted. And you asked the court to, to believe that you would hesitate to harass the Gibbs in order to get rid of them whenever and however that opportunity arose. Everything you say is completely untrue. Well, I'm sure the jury will have their own ideas about that. Uh, does your honour have any questions? No. You may return to the dock, Mr Aldrich. I call Kenneth Clayton. You are Kenneth Clayton? Yes, sir. And uh, you live at Park Cottage in Mary Stoke and Farm, Stoke and near Fulchester. That's right, sir. And what is your occupation, Mr. Clayton? I'm a senior stockman at St. Mary Stoke and Farms. Yes. You are Ralph Gibbs' successor? Yeah, that's right, sir. Yes. Where is Park Cottage in relation to the dairy complex? Well, it's about two and a half miles off. Yes. Why don't you live closer? Ah, well, when the Gibbs move out of their house, you see, I shall move into that. That's a stockman's house, see, that's where it should be. Yes. Is it convenient living so far away from the dairy complex? Yeah, it's all right, yeah. Yes, um, but should not the stockman live as close to the animals as possible to do his job properly? Well, yeah, but it ain't the end of the world if you don't, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever... <coughs> been inside the Gibbs house, which you eventually are going to occupy? Yeah, once, yeah. And when was that? Ah, uh, that was the day uh, 127 died. Yes. I found her dying, see, right, sent from uh, Mr. Ulrich, and then he sent for the vet. I told her to put down. And then Mr. Ulrich says, uh, right, he says, I'm going to see Ralph Gibbs about this, he says, and you coming on. So you went with him when he entered the house? Yeah. And what happened? 
Well, I can't remember. Uh, no. I mean, uh, when Mr. Aldridge uh, confronted Mr. Gibbs in his house, yeah. what happened? Well, there was an argument. Yes. Well, a long time ago now, I can't remember much, that it was an argument. Mr. Clayton, do you understand the question? Yeah, yeah. The accused entered Mr. Gibbs' lounge and saw Mr. Gibbs. Do you remember that? Yeah. You, you saw that? Oh, yeah. And then what passed between them? Well, I don't remember much except, uh, well, Mr. R, which was very abusive. Well, I'm sorry, Your Honour. Now, Mr. Clayton, there was a time when you claimed to have remembered, wasn't there? Ah, uh, you mean when I went to see Mr. Aldridge's solicitors? Yes. Yeah, but I can't remember now, though. Your Honour, I ask uh, leave to treat this witness as hostile. Mr. Lloyd. Under the circumstances, Your Honour, I shall not object. Uh, Mr. Clayton, Mr. Parsons, who called you to give evidence for the accused, now has my leave to treat you as a hostile witness. Ah, oh, what's that mean? It means that Mr. Parsons may now cross-examine you to try to ascertain why you appear to have changed sides. Did you, on August 3rd, 1976, go to the offices of Derring and King, solicitors to the defendant, and make a statement? Yeah. Did you sign a typed copy of that statement as true and correct? Yeah, I signed it, yeah. As true and correct? Well, I suppose so, yeah. Now, is this it? Would you pass that to the witness, please? Is this the original statement? Yeah. With your signature at the bottom? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Dated and signed August 3rd? Does it consist of your account of what happened when Mr. Aldridge met Mr. Gibbs in the lounge of Mr. Gibbs' house? on June 17th when you were present? Yeah. Then how is it you were able to make such a clear statement then, yet are totally unable to remember what happened at that meeting now, except to say that Mr. Aldrich was abusive? Well, I've been thinking about it. I'm not nearly so sure now, that's all. You've been thinking about it? Yeah. Have you discussed this matter with anyone? What, you mean discuss what happened? Well, discuss what you're prepared to remember of what happened. Well, I might have done, you know, friends and that, yeah. Yes. Is Ralph Gibbs a friend of yours? Yeah, I met him, yeah. Uh, in his home? Yeah. And on the farm? Yeah, when he handed over to me, yeah. Yes. Is, is he a friend? Well, not a particular one, no. Yeah. Has he ever discussed this matter with you? Well, I think he might have mentioned it, yeah. You think he might have mentioned it, but you can't recall for certain? No, not really. No. What about union meetings? Eh? Did you attend your local union meetings and meet him there too? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yes. How active a member are you of the Farm Workers' Union? Well, I'm a member. Yeah, but how active? Are you a committee member? Well, I do what I can, you know. Are you on the regional executive committee? Yeah. Now, what part have you taken in the campaign to abolish the tied cottage system? <laughs> well, we all want that, don't we? Answer the question. Well, I took part in a lot of the MPs, but, uh, I mean, I'm not on a tied cottage subcommittee or anything like that. Now, uh, Mr. Clayton, will you now please read the statement uh, that you made to the defendant solicitor. Oh, Your Honour, I must object to this. <clears throat> it is a cardinal tenet of our whole judicial system that witnesses are available for examination and cross-examination where there is a conflict of evidence. If the witness simply cannot remember, then that rule simply cannot be operated. And heaven knows it's by no means unusual for a case to take many months to come before the courts nowadays. This uh, witness's loss of memory is rather bizarre, Mr Lloyd. I think Mr Parsons entitled to put his original statement to him. It may serve to jog his memory. Uh, Your, Your Honour, it would be quite novel for such a statement to be admitted. It, it would then follow that if any witness's memory was at fault, his counsel could apply to have his original statement to the solicitor read out instead, a statement on which he could not be cross-examined, if he still couldn't remember any more clearly as a result. Oh, I don't think that follows at all, Mr Lloyd. I think we should hear the statement. His evidence may be due to a little more than mere loss of memory. Will Your Honour make a note of my objection? Oh, I will, certainly, if you wish. 
Mr. Parsons. Your Honour, now, Mr. Clayton, will you please read uh, the statement? <clears throat> At uh, 3 p.m. on Tuesday, June the 17th, Mr. Robert Ulrich asked me to accompany him to Mr. Gibbs's house. This was about 10.30 a.m. The front door was open, so we walked into the lounge where Mr. Gibbs was sitting watching the television. Mr. Gibbs and Mr. Ulrich then began to argue about when Mr. Gibbs was going to leave the house. Mr. Gibbs, almost immediately lost his temper, he began to shout, push Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Clayton, uh, the jury would like to hear this. If you could just go back a little, a little louder, please. Oh. <coughs> Mr. Gibbs almost immediately lost his temper and began to shout and push Mr. Aldrich in the chest with his right hand. Mrs. Gibbs entered at this point and began to scream. Mr. Aldrich was angry but tried to make Mr. Gibbs listen to what he was trying to say to him. I was standing by the window at this time. At no point did Mr. Aldrich strike or kick any person or object and at no stage did he say anything of a threatening or abusive nature. When it became clear that Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs were not going to listen, Mr. Aldrich turned his back and walked out and I followed. Now you've uh, read that out, Mr. Clayton, do you remember the scene it describes? Well, I can't honestly say I do, no. I've got a very bad memory for that sort of thing, especially after what has flown under the bridge. After what? Well, I mean, it was a long time ago now, wasn't it? When you made that statement, were you still seeking employment from Mr. Aldrich? No, no, that had been fixed up. Were you seeking any favours of any sort from him? Well, um, Larger cottage, perhaps. A bigger wage. I can, of course, recall Mr. Aldridge on these points. No, no, nothing like that, Your Honour. Mr. Parsons? No, uh, Your Honour. Uh, just four weeks ago, uh, Mr. Clean, did you accept nomination as a candidate for the regional chairmanship of your union? Yeah, but there's no connection. You, uh, are you contesting the chairmanship? Yeah. Does your success depend on a popular vote by the ordinary membership? Yeah, that's right. And is your union as a whole opposed to the tied cottage system? Yeah, of course we are, right. So, it would scarcely improve your chances of winning the election to be seen in support of a farmer on a tied cottage incident over a matter of harassment, would it? Ah, oh, well, that may be so, but I'd be a bloody fool to stand here and say I could remember if I couldn't. But that'd be perjury. You wouldn't want me to stand here and say that I can remember if I honestly can't, would you? Would you, my honour? No, I would not. Any more questions, Mr. Parsons? No, Your Honour. Mr. Lloyd? No, Your Honour. You may leave the witness box, Mr. Clayton. That is the case for the defence, Your Honour. Members of the jury, it is my duty to instruct you as to the law in this matter. That, at any rate, is straightforward. The defendant is accused of harassment under the Rent Act of 1965. That is to say, he is accused of doing acts calculated to interfere with the peace or comfort of the residential occupier or his household, or withdrawing services reasonably required for the occupation of the premises as a residence in an attempt to make the occupier leave. The learned counsel have rightly gone into the background of the dispute between the defendant and Mr. Gibbs in order to show that certain witnesses may have had ulterior motives for not telling you the whole truth. Now, the prosecution allege two instances of harassment. Now, the first is the claim that the water, electricity and sewerage to the Gibbs's house were cut off deliberately by the defendant in order to harass them. Now here there is a straight conflict of evidence and you must decide which version is the true one. Now the second instance uh, which took place on uh, June the 17th was when the defendant entered the home of Mr and Mrs Gibbs and it is alleged uh, threatened them in various ways. Here again, there is a straight conflict of evidence. Now, remember, if the defendant simply lost his temper, then that would be no crime. 
But if he actually threatened them with unpleasant consequences if they did not leave, then that would be. Now, I must warn you that the merits or demerits of the tied cottage system should not concern you in arriving at your verdict. You should not exercise any sympathies you may feel on that topic one way or the other. On the evidence, and on that alone, you must arrive at your verdict. Now remember, the prosecution must satisfy you so that you feel sure the offence has been committed before you can return a verdict of guilty. Any reasonable doubt resolves the case in favour of the defendant. Will you please now retire and consider your verdict? Horse down. Will the foreman please stand? I'll just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? No. Have uh, at least ten of you agreed upon your verdict? Yes. And what is your verdict? Please answer, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Very well. You may go.